Welcome to Never Rewrite. I'm Isaac Askew, and today I'm joined by Dustin Ray. Um, Jeffrey isn't here today, so it's me and Dustin today uh, talking about some topics that we think are just either interesting or that we have something to say about, I guess. So one that we recently discussed an idea for was uh, perfectionism in programming. Uh, it sounded like uh, we both had some things to say about it. So Dustin, why don't you kick us off? Yeah, sure. So perfectionism in, in programming is something I've seen, um, I think, ruin certain projects. Hmm. And I've also seen where it can be a good thing if balanced with the right team, uh, I think is kind of the the takeaway that I have. Um, one, okay. I guess I'll start us out with like a, a horror story of like how this can go terribly, terribly wrong. Um, and this can be done both on the engineering side or on like the founder side or the business side as well. This story is from the business side. Um, but I think as engineers, we also have a responsibility to, to speak up and, and say, Hey, I think we're kind of going in this direction. Um, and I think at the time when, uh, I heard this story, I don't think I had the experience to know what to have done in this situation. Um, but I worked with a client years and years ago, um, that was essentially pre-revenue, like pre-customers, uh, building out, um, I would say it was more advanced than an MVP. It was more like a, mm -hmm. a V1. Uh, this customer had a lot of experience in the market, so they had a really good idea of like what the software needed to do. Um, but they also that also meant that they had an idea of like how much it needed to do before they even launched, given like mm -hmm. other software in the market. Uh, and I think sometimes that is it can be kind of a, a mistake or like a foot gun, where you're trying to compete with somebody that's already in the market but you actually may want to take a different approach completely. And in this case, what ended up happening is this client essentially designed and iterated themselves like out of business before revenue came um, because mm -hmm. they just kept iterating on the product indefinitely pre-launch with no feedback. Um, they just felt like they kept, um, you know, finding ways to improve it. Um, and they felt like it had to essentially be better than all of the existing products in, in like every feature. Right. And I think that's where, um, you know, I think that's a fallacy. It's interesting. I've never heard it phrased as iterating pre-release. Usually when I think iterating, I'm thinking about iterating on something that is live. Right. So right. you're saying that they just wouldn't release the product until it was perfect. So they just kept Correct. iterating on just the concept of it. <laughs> yeah. 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 And I've actually seen this more than once, uh, after that time, I've been very keen to like spot mm -hmm. it and, and let clients know they're heading in that direction. Um, but you know, yeah, I've seen it before, uh, as well, like with other clients. Um, so yeah, it is, it's something that I think is, uh, maybe more common than people would, uh, expect. I think, especially if you're not coming from like a really software, like a technical background, uh, mm -hmm. like say you have more of a business acumen or like a product background, you may not, you know, I think you may not realize like the iteration, you know, that there's value in the iteration that, and that some people may even be willing to jump ship for like one specific workflow or one specific feature that you just do better than the bigger competitor. Who's now like more generalized. Um, so I think that's like more or early stage, but it, mm -hmm. I, I can also imagine that happening even um, at the multi-product platform level, right? So if you have a product manager, you're launching a new product, uh, and you can imagine just iterating on designs and concepts essentially yeah. indefinitely until the point of the opportunity being passed you. Yeah, I, I've actually run into this a few times, both in in working for companies and working as a consultant. Um, definitely, like you'll have a, a client that thinks their idea is going to change the world or that they are definitely got a new angle that no one's ever heard of. Right. And that it's such a crazy, awesome new angle that they have to keep quiet about it. And, right, you know, right. they can't let it right. people know because then somebody might copy them. But that's the thing. Like, if it's a good enough idea, someone's going to copy you anyway. There's no point in, like, keeping it secret. Um, yeah. And so I was talking to them about an MVP. I'm like, you should see if this is an idea that's actually worth exploring. You know, if you're so confident about it, then just being first to market is not the thing that's going right. to help you out with it. Like, again, there's yeah. so many copycats that will pop up the moment you have a good idea. Yeah. And it took some, we actually had uh, an episode of this podcast where Jeffrey and I discussed MVPs and what an MVP really was. Because mm -hmm. um, the idea is you're trying to literally get the minimum thing out there to gauge right. viability, essentially. Because right. if you build 
something people want or you think people want and then nobody actually uses it after, you know, two years of planning and, you know, all this right. acceptance criteria and building, you're quiet, you don't say anything, then you release and nobody uses it. You, you've just sunk a ton of cash. Right. So it's right. way easier. And I've talked to at least one other person that actually did a similar concept uh, where they just like built their thing and didn't even have like automation. They just built like right. every response they would just manually respond to. Yeah. And they would just the mechanical Turk strategy. Yeah. yeah. To see if it was useful before they end up spending more money into it. And I right. think that's, that's the main thing is people are not willing to have like a, a cheap little version of their dream go out because it, it cheapens their dream. Right. This right. is what right. I right. want. And it was going to be so perfect, but they just don't have the money for it. Cause everyone's yeah. you know, like, it's a meme that someone's like, Oh, I've got an app idea that would totally change. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 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 No, I, if I had a dollar for every time I hear that, I'd already be rich. Yeah. yeah. No, I, I hear you. The, yeah. The other, I even have kind of a, a radical opinion about it. I, I was also mm -hmm. of the camp of like, Hey, I think it's almost like an engineering's first instinct, right? It's like MVP. Let's build the minimum viable product. Like let's reduce the risk. Mm -hmm. And I think that is a, definitely a good approach. And I think there's, I think there's even like a step zero though, is like, that I really enjoy. I've been recommending it. I'm using it myself is like building landing pages, right. And see if you can, mm, yeah. can you get the go to market motion correct enough that you can get people to join a waiting list or even like an email list where you're kind of hyping it up and delivering value at the same time. And, and, you know, I think that's a good form of, of market research. And, you know, if you, if you can't get that moving, it's probably unlikely that your MVP is going to gain traction, you know, also, you know, so there's kind of a right. two step process there. Yeah. One of the stories I was mentioning, actually, uh, the guy's name is Darby Frey. He's like a, a, I don't know if he's still an engineering manager, if he's just a lead engineer now at, at GitLab, but we worked together at Active Campaign for a bit. Uh, and he had an idea along with a friend of his uh, that was essentially, you know, whenever you fill out those one on ones mm -hmm. um, and you, they just had like, they're like randomly generated questions to get you right. engaged with your manager to talk about stuff in one on ones. Um, it was like questions for that. And he said, I wonder if anybody would actually care about that. So he, he did just what you were talking about. He put like a landing mm -hmm. page and let people sign up for it and just go ahead and pay for it. Like preemptively yeah, pay for it. Right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then when people asked for him, he actually typed out questions, for people, <laughs> you know, and there was a lot of people who had interest and actually were willing to give money before the product was built. And yeah. then, then he realized, oh, okay, there's an idea here. And he ended up building a platform from it. I'm not going to throw the name out here for now. You can research yeah. if you want. Um, but he ended up building a platform from it with his friend. And uh, that's how they started the product idea with people already trying to give him money or already really interested in it yeah. instead of the other route of, Oh, I got this really great idea. <laughs> right. I'd be really quiet. Cause it's such an incredible idea that nobody yeah. would ever think about it. But me, I'm so great. Right. Right. You know? right. <laughs> yeah. Yep. Yeah. No, I, I, I see that a lot. And I think, uh, especially with like, I know AI is such a buzzword, but I, I was reading an article and even Forbes the other day about like the cost of software and the, uh, kind of commoditization of, of software because it's so much easier to write now. And I think like with that kind of happening, the cost is going down so much that like the technology is not your moat anymore, right? Mm -hmm. Like, you know, anyone can quickly spin up kind of a, a proof of concept. Um, yeah. You know, the, the work is really in, in building the audience and building the user base and hearing what they want and then, and then making the changes. Uh, and I, I, I wonder if we'll even see, um, maybe even, a an era of like quote unquote sloppier software. That's like maybe more hyper-personalized, like, you know, like driven mm. towards specific, uh, purpose-driven situations, uh, as opposed to like what we build today with like, you know, kind of SaaS as a like software as a service. Right. Um, I, I wonder if we'll see kind of more of a company start to iterate on their own software and, and kind of build that discipline internally, uh, as well. And I think that, that all plays right. into the same thing here is like, even if you're using AI or whatever mechanism you're using to generate these, these products or tools, uh, I think this concept applies the same way. Yeah. If, if your mock-up ideas are made easier to mock up and launch and get and gain interest on, I could see that being kind of like a new era of, of more niche apps. Cause mm -hmm. I've definitely had a couple of app ideas that I just kind of worked on with friends uh, and you know, we, we taught ourselves iOS that way we could like work on our first, um, as a Swift, well, so we could work on our mm -hmm. first, uh, uh, iOS app. Um, and 
you know, now I, I, I went there, I went to ChatGPT recently and I was like, write me some code that would, you know, generate <laughs> essentially what I had been building. And it did a pretty good job at it. And so I had to like tinker with it. But it was a good enough job that it got me a boilerplate. And I was like, oh, if I had had this, you know, two years ago, we probably would have got started and momentum going a little earlier, even if it's not perfect. It's just, yeah. it's exciting. Uh, yeah, in the yeah, same yeah. sense that I'll go to chat GPT and like help, have it help me organize my notes. I'll just have like, mm -hmm. can you mm -hmm. put these in order of what you think makes sense priority wise or um, whatever. And, you know, it'll give me a little template and I'm like, oh, this is much nicer than my own little scribbles. So there's things yeah, like yeah. that that kind of add up. Yeah. The, the other thing that I think about too, when talking about like perfectionism is, I know we've dealt with this recently too, is, you know, it's one thing to like iterate when you're trying to experiment and, and like validate ideas, but it's another thing when you have, which I think you were alluding to at the beginning is like you have software in production, you mm -hmm. know, and you have people using it, their businesses depend on it. Uh, the change management process of that kind of environment is a lot stricter. Um, you know, how do you kind of navigate the production environment? Um, with this in mind, right? Like, you know, there's certain kind of the, the way I'm thinking about it, as we've talked in the past is there's, there's certain workflows that once people are using them, they can essentially never break. So how do you kind of get the right level of iteration at maybe the feature and engineering level, um, you know, ahead of those releases or those changes without kind of falling into the perfectionism trap and essentially never releasing. What is this, what is this loop that you essentially can't, can never get out of? Can you give me an example of what you're thinking? Yeah. Yeah. Perfect. Yeah. An example would be like, um, so for example, like your, your banking software, right? Like if your banking software makes a transaction or shows you the wrong, you know, balance or, you know, certain things like that, you know, that's going to be a major negative experience mm -hmm. versus something that's like, you know, if the, um, the login button was a little misaligned with the left border, you know, you're probably not going to get some churn over, over that, but you know, you know, so the, there's like certain features where it's like, you don't want to be like iterating imperfectly on that flow. You want to be right. like maybe, I think what I'm getting at is maybe more intentional about those changes. Um, but without getting into, you know, falling into like perfectionism where, you know, you gotcha. know you so you're essentially that. asking where that, where is that line? Yeah. Right. Yeah. Cause for, yeah, obviously for finances, I don't want <laughs> my, my account balance to sometimes, Right. Be in, you know, a beta mode. <laughs> that, <laughs> right. shows me, that shows me some new features. I want to always know my money. Like, I don't want any features around that. Right. So if somebody is redesigning part of that software for a calculation or for pulling something and, you know, something goofs and suddenly my balance shows is zero dollars, that's not acceptable. That's going to scare the crap out of me. Like, where did my money right. go? And then versus, you know, maybe stuff is in beta, like um, the login, like you were saying for the button, the login page for Chase. Right. Uh, is made simpler or reorganized or whatever. Then some people go into it, get to one experience, some get to another. And maybe the, one of the experiences, the button's goofed or something's bad. Then I'm like, oh, that, that looks tacky, but I can still log in and check my balance. Right, right. Yeah. So it's, I feel like there's, it's a, it's a, it's a combination or I guess like a, there's a hair splitting between like type of company you are, or software that you're building, like finance would obviously have stricter rules. And then the respectability of what you're trying to build. Like if you're mm -hmm. a bank, probably need to be super perf perfectionist versus if you are some brand new company that's trying to change things that offers a solution no one has seen and it's convenient, then maybe every now and then whenever they try to log in and it doesn't work, they're like, ah, uh, these guys are just a team of four people <laughs> and, I, and, and it's a free software. So I'm not super angry. I can't log in right now. I know they're going to fix it on the back end versus that's a little more fleshed out product and now i'm paying you 300 bucks a month for it and it's not working right so you've got i feel like that that perfectionism line just is going to depend on the severity of, of that like right right yeah but i think not, it's not just line. industry though right it's like every from my experience at least every software business at least in the b2b space has a flow that is like that. So usually, mm -hmm. especially if it's e-commerce or anything like that, it's, all, it's all obviously the checkout flow. Um, but even in the SaaS world, right? Like think about like uh, sign up and onboarding, right? Like if the sign up or onboarding flow is, you know, not working, which is something you would often iterate on because you want to make changes and experiment and, mm -hmm. and improve it. Um, but if that flow goes, goes down, right? Like you're losing revenue. So it's like things that can also, it's something you would want to experiment with because it has high ROI if you make the right changes. 
mm-hmm. it's also high risk, right? Because it's such a friction point for new users. Yeah, that makes sense. I think um, the engineers on this, like, 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 I still think it's kind of more of a conversation on uh, what kind of thing you are delivering versus right. almost engineer discontent and versus yeah. like leadership discontent. Uh, yeah. So like an example, um, I was working on a product that sent text messages to people and is essentially for texting uh, links to people to to pay their bills virtually instead of paying, uh, instead of waiting for a bill to come in the mail. I was essentially trying to mm-hmm. reduce the whole mailing thing. Uh, and we did MVP for that. And because of that, we rushed this architecture because we were like, do people even want this? We're going to build right. it cheaply with a few people. We're not going to do a ton of planning. We're going to let the customer tell us how to iterate on this, not what we think they want. So we did that. We built it lean. People loved it. So then we were in this really unfortunate but fortunate space of now people really want it and we have a ton of people using it. And now we have to iterate on this in a way that doesn't start breaking sending. Because at first they're like, oh, this is fine. Why is this? Why why, why are you having problems sending now? It's because our solution was not meant to scale. It was like a very quick MVP. So there was a lot of bumpy areas as we tried to transition and uh, add like good, decent infrastructure to this that from a professional aspect, that perfectionism needs to be there. If if they if they're depending on us to deliver bills, then that's how they're getting money from people. And right, people know right. that money, they owe money. That's a huge swap in their flow, and that needs perfection, mm-hmm. right? Or at least a way to you know correct quickly if text fail to go out. At least we can try again in two hours and let them know we had a blip or something like that. Right, right, right. Um, so then that's a whole shift on our end because like our first philosophy was like this can be flaky. You know, as long as it it serves enough to show that people want it. And that's a complete paradigm shift now as a developer and, and a different personalities, which is something we've discussed on other episodes where you might actually need three startup brained people. And then once you're ready to do it the enterprise way, pull in enterprise level people who are really good with quality control, really good with, you know, systems design. And now the startup people that started that maybe aren't the same people you want working on the enterprise version of it because it's just different personalities. Right. Well, I think there's a, a lot of lessons I've seen too, from like almost failure from success, right? Like it's kind of like what you're, you know, that's kind of how I frame it. Mm-hmm. It's almost, it's not like a failure, but it's like, you you kind of have this like bumpy event where like you kind of have this scaling event and like you weren't prepared for it. It's a good, like right. you said, it's a good thing, but it's a bad thing. Cause it's like, it's a weird reputation paradigm. Um, have you learned any lessons I think from, from that launch that you would maybe use in the in the future to kind of mitigate that like you still want to have the success but how could you mitigate yeah. the negativity the fallout well i'll talk through some lessons i learned some might not be relevant to this episode <laughs> but maybe in talking through them out loud we'll, we'll learn something <laughs> um one of the lessons i think that we learned from that product in particular was um there is a point in which you stop saying yes to the customer right. Because we built something that I really enjoyed. And then, well, can it do this? Can it do that? Can it do that? And we were so excited to have a, a market fit, essentially, that we were like, yeah, right. we can do that. We can do that. We can do that. Uh, and then after a while, we were doing a lot of mixtures of Mechanical Turk and mm-hmm. SMS sending, where there were some some like bills they wanted to send us, and we had to find different ways to parse those bills. Or you know maybe just temporarily <laughs> send them in, in our own format, or just find some kind of creative ways to say yes to the customer. Can you support A-B testing or, or, or A-B right. different text flows, different languages in your flows? Yes, 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 yeah. yes. And so after a while, the team got overwhelmed with both trying to deliver these feature requests and to try to refactor the system into one that was more sustainable and it could scale with, with the customers. So that mm-hmm. was kind of the first issue was our resources got split um, and trying to both refactor and move things to this new system that's scalable and deliver features in the old system means sometimes duplicative work. Yeah. Uh, and then your resources get further split from feature development, double feature development in the new system, and then uh, bug fixes and maintenance from the old system, yeah. essentially. Yeah. Yeah. The only other guard I've, I've seen be somewhat effective is like, it's just a, t- it's just the standard, you know, engineering put a bound on it. Right. Like, mm-hmm. If you can, 
if you kind of know what your upper limit is, then you can kind of start to have a, a bounds on maybe the user count or something like that. And it's like, then if you hit that ceiling, you know, okay, we've got something here. Let's close yeah. the doors and figure out how to support this and kind of roll it out. That would be kind of how I would think about it. But again, it's sometimes it's like a, a rocket ship. You just have to you know, be along for the ride. Well, on, on the perfectionism topic there, there was actually, an, 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 none that I'm saying it out loud, interestingly, we did have this kind of split in the developers working on it. And some mm. were discontent about the way in which we were refactoring it and scaling it, essentially. Uh, mm. Because we had a few different ways to scale the system. They wanted to do it one way, which is more sustainable, but took longer. Yeah. And the product team wanted it to work for the new customers. And so there was still more cut corners and we delivered an, another imperfect software that solved the problem a little better, but it wasn't like the interim solution. And that actually, right. because we knew it was still a stop gap. Yeah. Um, some engineers lost a bit of morale on that and they didn't want to rework it again. Uh, mm -hmm. And I, I think that's where the perfectionism thing comes in because there's a point where like, as an engineer, you think, we should be doing this a better way than I have to do this right now. Cause my hand is literally just forced by money. Right. Right. Um, and that's both a thing that helps you. I mean, like you're getting money. And so like, I guess as an engineer, you, engineer, you have to be okay with right. uh, a, a compromise, a half solution. Yeah. Uh, even as you continue, even, even after you're like, okay, I'm going to write the, the, the real version of this now or V1, there's still V1, there's still V2, there's still V3 right. coming right. up. Um, it'll never be perfect at the end. So don't, don't try to jump three different versions. So, so you still want to solve the problem at hand. And that's a tricky, a tricky one. Cause you're like, Oh, cool. Finally, we get to do it the right way. No, you don't. <laughs> you're still <laughs> limited by customer complaints, constraints, right. resource constraints. What if you have layoffs? Right. You know, right. like <laughs> economic when your shifts. teams have to, you know, like there's, it, there's plenty more there. Yeah. Yeah. No, I, I've experienced that as well. How, how would you, approach handling like those team dynamics like how do you kind of get your engineers like you know back in the game that depends on the personality of the engineer yeah 100 <laughs> percent um i think uh putting on a little manager hat for a moment even though i've never been a manager <laughs> just a team lead i guess yeah. um i think the best way to do that is just to have a, a conversation with your team um, if everyone understands why you're making those changes and why you've made those decisions, it's a, it, 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 the pill is a bit easier to swallow. Right. If you just join a meeting and everyone says, we have to deliver this, it needs to be done in two weeks. You know, you're like, well, wait, what's the deal? Why am I building this? Right. Why does it have to be right. two weeks? Cause there's not nearly enough time to do this in two weeks. Right. That's going to cause discontent. But if you, and we ended up doing this, which I thought was a really, uh, illuminating idea is we put engineers on the customer support calls. And so mm -hmm. we got to hear firsthand, like mm -hmm. the engineer wouldn't say anything. They don't have to. Right, right, right. The product, you know, customer facing product teams and anybody else sales or whatever would be on the call too. And the, the engineer would just be listening to all the complaints. Yeah. And they were like, well, look, I'm gonna go somewhere else if this isn't added soon, because we need this to be working by this particular date. You right. guys sold me and said you had the solution yep. that's not ready yet. And then the engineer goes, okay, I, I feel that pressure now. And now I understand right. why the rush, because I think if you have a complete uh, compartmentalization of the engineer from, oh, they never get to hear the customer complaints, then they also don't yeah. feel the pressure of why right. we're having to make these half solutions. It's just tickets on a board, right? Right. And so that, kind of, that pressure paints a lot of context. And I think if you either pull them in and let them see that context firsthand from the customer, or you pull them aside and say, hey, and just essentially funnel that same information to them and let them know why. Uh, and yeah. be like, we like your work. I know you hate coding this way. I know you want to do it the right way, but right now we don't have those constraints. And if we did it the way you wanted it to do, by the time you delivered the way that you're saying you want to deliver it, we might not even have those customers anymore. We might have to right. kill the product. And if right. you frame it that way, like the product will die if you try to make it perfect. And then we, we won't have any money uh, that, generally maybe don't phrase it so you know dramatically but that uh you know that helps paint the conversation a bit more than yeah. just like no john you have to code really crappy stuff and you just have to get yeah. over it 
<laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's about building buy-in and, and like mm -hmm. building some empathy, you know, for the, yeah. like for the engineer, for the engineer to have empathy for uh, the customer and the end user. So, yes. Yeah. hundred percent agree. hundred percent would agree on getting engineers in customer calls. Um, even if they're not compliant, so just hear how they use the software, especially like watching right. them use it. Like it's eye opening watching end users use the software and on both mm -hmm. ends of the spectrum, both like the users that are struggling and both your power users. Like I always find it fascinating to see how like power users use the software, but yeah, highly recommend uh, uh, jumping on customer calls. You, you've reminded me something of something that uh, Sentry has. If you have the, uh, like the front end flows installed for Sentry where you can see what the user is doing, like the, yeah. the DOM perspective, there's an area they'll report rage click. Yeah, and yeah, if you yeah. re click back through and watch it again, you'll see like they clicked a button and maybe it didn't load or the back end right. was churning and didn't respond and there was no feedback. And so you can you see them spam the button a few times. And now Sentry understands, oh, this is a rage click. And they'll actually report on those. Yeah. Um, and those are also kind of fun experiences when you actually see slower users. If you're the power user because you built it and you're like, click, 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 click. Yeah, this right. works fine. Versus somebody who's like going real slow, it's confused about the software, you put them yourself in their shoes. Um, that will help you have a lot more customer empathy for sure. Yeah, hundred percent. Well, all right. Are there any other uh, comments on perfectionism before we wrap up today's episode? That's it on my end. It's a good combo. All right. So, Dustin, if there's, um, we ask this usually on each time, but if there's any uh, anybody here that wants to get in contact with you or any um, organization you want to throw your support behind, uh, yeah, this is your your time. Yeah, feel free to reach out at redhook.agency. Appreciate it. All right. Well, thanks for listening. I'm Isaac Askew, and this is Never Rewrite.